But I said to the director in Kent, I'm sorry, I can't do your job anymore. And he said, why not? I said, well, because I've just been offered this part in the West End. And he said, well, you, you can't do it. You signed my contract. And then suddenly, you know, this, this enormity of what contracts mean hit me. Being able to listen to other people and understand where they're coming from is such a basic, such a basic need. I remember being in, when I was in South Africa, I was lucky enough to be there while Nelson Mandela was still around. And what people used to say about Mandela was that when he talked to you, you felt like you were the center of the universe. Not enough people actually spend time really connecting with what their values are. Why it's important is that when you understand what your values are, you'll tend to make better decisions. Decisions which are more in alignment with who you are. I gave you an example earlier where a director sent me a line saying, if we all go around breaking contracts, where does that leave any of us? And that completely changed my behavior because processing that, that is a value. My guest for this episode is Steve Payne. Steve is a keynote speaker, speechwriter, performance coach, professional actor, and the founder of the Academy of Coaching and Training. He's one of the very few certified master trainers of neuro-linguistic programming worldwide, and he's the co-author of the critically acclaimed book, My 31 Practices. Steve's been a really important mentor to me over the years since I first attended one of his NLP courses back in 2011. I've been privileged to learn from and work with him ever since, and we now regularly collaborate on leadership and sales training programs. Steve is an absolute master coach and facilitator, and I'm delighted to have him on the show to share his wisdom and his experience. If you enjoy what you hear, please leave a review, like, comment, and subscribe. It would mean the world to me and will help this podcast reach as many people as possible. You don't want to miss this. Enjoy. Steve, welcome to the show. My first question for you, in life, what's the most important thing you've ever had to pitch for? Whew, you don't mess about, do you? Um, I think, I think the, the, most, the, the most obvious thing that jumps to mind when you say that um, is getting into drama school years ago, many years ago, because it was such a dream for me. It was the thing I wanted more than anything in the world. And it wasn't easy, and I had no background in drama, so I felt like a, an imposter anyway, um, stepping into that environment. Um, and it was, it was, it was really challenging um, because I knew I'd have to do things like sing, and and I can't sing. And I thought, if I'm, well, I'm not going to impress them with that, so I've got to, I've got to, I've got to find something, you know, that they want. Um, and so that, that, I think that was the most important thing that, because that was for me, it's the turning point in my life. My life seemed to be funneled towards that. That was the dream. And so I felt a huge amount of pressure, uh, to, to get that right. Um, and so I think that was the most important thing that comes to mind. So you, you, you went to central school of speech and drama and, uh, if you're, audition experience was anything like mine training to be an actor that wasn't the only school that you auditioned for is that right no i auditioned for five or six of them so i i did the sort of the rounds if you like of all the ones I made a, a list of the top drama schools and then went and auditioned for them all and uh, in the first year i was 18 i was just leaving school and or i just left school and i auditioned for I think it was five of them that first year. I got recalled at all of them, uh, which, which, which builds the pressure, of course. And then eventually I got into one, but not the others. And the one I dreamed of, the one I really wanted central. And so uh, when I got into the one, then I had that conundrum. Do I, do I go to that one or do I risk it all again, go work away for a year somewhere, come back and do it all again with the possibility of not getting in anywhere? And, and that was a real tough decision for me. I mean, that was, I, I remember the stress of thinking, you know, I could blow it here. Um, should I just accept that? Yeah. So that? That was really tough. That was really tough. And, and you, were, you were 18, presumably, or 18 or 19 when you took that risk. I was, yeah. So I, I left school. Um, I'd, I'd always said at school I wanted to be an actor, but I was painfully shy. So people would think, what, you? Don't, don't be silly. So I put myself through the school plays <laughs> to try and get better after a very traumatic experience at school that uh, I told everybody I wanted to be an actor. And, um, and then I was asked to be the, uh, the secretary for the sports and social union at school. 
And I, there was a girl I fancied in the year, and I thought, well, she's going to be impressed with, with that if I take, you know, if I'm the secretary sitting next to the teacher at the front of the class. Little did I know what would happen and what was involved. And the teacher said to me, I was there. My whole year was there. That girl was there. Uh, all the teachers were there. And then the, uh, the person running the meeting handed me the minutes book and said, I'm going to ask Steve now to read out the minutes of the last meeting. And I had no idea he was going to do that. And suddenly, you know, my, my heart, I told everybody I wanted to be an actor, right? And so here I am sat there having to read these minutes. And uh, immediately my heart started pounding in my chest and I felt that, that burning color flush. Uh, I started to sweat. And, and as I looked down at these words, aware of all these eyes staring at me, I stuttered and spluttered my way through every sentence and every word. And it, I was so nervous, I couldn't finish a sentence. The sweat would literally drip off my cheeks and off my nose onto the ink and blur the ink so I actually couldn't read the words either. And I managed to get through this and I was so, I'm feeling it now by the way, I was so embarrassed. I can tell. When I'd finished, I couldn't raise my head off the page because I couldn't make eye contact with anybody. And so for 45 minutes in the meeting, I sat like this until eventually everybody left the meeting and filed past. And I just wanted the world to, or the earth to open up and swallow me. And I swore at that moment, I would never again put myself in that position. And, and so I would you know, read books at night out loud to be able to, to do that. And, and I wanted to go to drama school. So I you know, then, uh, 18 years old, auditioned for drama school. And I was told when I said, uh, I wanna audition, first of all, for the National Youth Theater, which was my sort of progression step towards drama school. And um, I remember one of the teachers saying, you won't get into the National Youth Theatre. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of the main place. So why don't you audition for the Manchester Youth Theatre? No disrespect to the Manchester Youth Theatre. But, um, but the thinking was, it's, you know, it's, it's smaller, less people apply, you, you'll be able yeah. to get in. So I auditioned for the Manchester Youth Theatre uh, and got in. And I auditioned for the National Youth Theatre and got in. And, um, and that gave me the confidence then to, to go forward and audition for all the drama schools that you mentioned and central and and go through that process so yeah i was 18 18 19 by the time i auditioned and then of course i didn't get in the first year had to make that yeah. decision and then when when i was 20 i think i actually started yeah brilliant story um oh. it, so if, if that was the kind of big audition that sort of started you on a particular journey uh, is there a is there a pitch in life that's kind of got away something that you think oh that would have been a a really interesting opportunity or I wonder what would have happened had I gone down that route. Uh, I th I, think, I think it was actually an opportunity because I I in between acting jobs and you'll know this very well Dominic that um, as an actor you know you you're in and out of work you know you finish a job and then you've got to find the next one and so I used to work in a sales company and they had an office in South Africa. And they asked me if I'd go down to South Africa for three months. And, uh, and basically help that company sort of turn around because it wasn't performing very well. And I remember at the time I had a few auditions coming up and I remember turning down an audition because I, I, I was gonna go to South Africa. And, I, and I've always loved travel and I was very excited by that. Um, and I thought the auditions will always be there but this opportunity wouldn't be there. So I, I took it. What I discovered is that the audition I turned down wasn't actually an audition. It had been miscommunicated and it was a job. And it was an acting job in, in a television series. Um, and it wasn't for a, a running part, but it was definitely a great opportunity. Um, and so I didn't turn that down. I just misunderstood the communication Missed it. and went away for three months. But now that I'm talking, actually, there was another moment, which was I, was doing, I just signed on to do a play in Kent a two regional touring theater and i auditioned for the west end for a part in um in a Bell ben elton play and i got the part but i'd already accepted the part in kent and so i said to the director in kent i'm sorry i can't do your job anymore and he said why not i said well because i've just been offered this part in the west end and he said well you, you can't do it you signed my contract and then suddenly you know this this enormity of what contracts mean hit me yeah. and and the timing of it you know because the west end for a young actor your first gig in the west end it's a big thing and i remember having eventually after lots of toing and froing having to turn down the opportunity in the west end because i'd signed the contract for the job in kent and i remember 
that that for me felt like one that got away because as, as you know everybody goes to the west end it's in the center of things casting directors are going to see you and it's a great opportunity yeah. and so that i think was a, a huge opportunity that that was just unfortunate timing really did, uh, did the director in Kent still allow you to be part of the production? He didn't then go, well, well you've, you've scorned me. Well, do you know what? That's a really interesting thing because um, I, I'd, I'd, I'd been in many plays with that director in Kent and, and I thought in my head, oh, he'll see what a great opportunity this is for me and, of course, just uh, let me go. For him, he'd, he'd hired me as the lead. It was, in, it was a Jane Eyre. Um, and I was playing the lead uh, male role in it. And he'd built, I'd done the auditions with him. I'd sat there next to him in the auditions or, and, and helped audition the cast. And so my involvement was quite big. And so we had this toing and froing, and it was really interesting because I wrote to Equity and explained the situation to Equity. Um, I I'd, I'd, I'd tried everything I could to, uh, to persuade him to let me go and do this play. And I remember nothing, nothing had worked, and we'd had this really rocky relationship at that time because of this. And eventually he sent me um, a message and all the message said was, if we all go around breaking contracts, where does that leave any of us? And it was that one line, after all the toing and froing and all of the different arguments that we'd had, that one line just changed everything because I, I couldn't disagree with it. You know, it was, I mean, yeah. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't disagree. And so that moment is when I then stopped um I, I wrote to the the producers of the uh the show in the west end said i couldn't do it went and did his play and we cleared the air the first thing we did was clear the air and and we came you know we, we explained both of our points of view so that i didn't think he was trying to block my career and he didn't think i was uh, not interested in um yeah. in what he was doing and so that was a huge moment for me and also highlighted the importance yeah. of being true to your values because you know i i couldn't take the other job when I read that and agreed with it. Do you know what I mean? It was really... Yeah, mm. yeah that, the, the idea of kind of values and perspective as well. It's so easy in those sorts of situations to only be able to see the world through your own lens, but that message obviously shifted things massively and you could you, you could see it from a, a whole new angle. Yeah. Um, Steve, you're, you are uh, a successful author, uh, a speaker, a coach. Uh, you're one of a small handful, I think a, a hundred, I believe, of master trainers of neuro-linguistic programming in the world. Um, we'll get into what that means and what that is a little bit later on. But what what's your story? So you started as, a, as an actor. As a, as a young child, Did did was that the dream, like from from 10 or 11 or, or was there something else and how did you navigate that acting career to end up where you are today yeah uh, that's a great question I mean I remember as a young kid I was eight years old and I was sat in a barber shop somewhere in Oxfordshire and they were really fussing around the person who was sat next to me and when that person left somebody told me that that was the director of the James Bond film and it was like for me it was like oh my god you know, and then I suddenly realized that, you know, that, that film or those films rather were, were, were not real. You know, they, they were made and there was a process for making them and all this kind of stuff. And so I became fascinated with television. I became a bit of a, a film addict. And then my parents lived in Germany and my dad was in the Air Force. We traveled a lot. And so when I flew back home, I, I didn't know people where my parents lived. And what I would do is I would rent loads of videos back in the old sort of Betamax videos days. And I, my whole holidays would be spent watching movies. And I would collect film review magazine and I would cut out all the different bits and pieces from the films and I would stick them over my walls. And I, I became completely obsessed with films. And, um, and, and, I, and I was completely fixated on the fact that I wanted to be an actor. And I remember a careers master asking me what I wanted to do. And I said, you know, I want to be a policeman, a doctor, a fireman, uh, an astronaut, and all these things. I didn't want to say I want to do one thing and follow one path. I wanted to experience everything. And I kind of thought, how could I, how could I do that? And the only way I could really think of that, that I could do all of those things was to become an actor and, and play them. Uh, I remember also being in an economics class during my A-levels. And it was the day the first space shuttle was taking off. 
And so I excused myself to go to the toilet and I went to the TV room instead. <laughs> I sat in the TV room and then I think the launch was delayed by an hour or something. Like that. And so I stayed watching that. And then I came back after two hours to the, to the end of the class. And I wrote to NASA to ask them what I needed to do to become an astronaut. And I remember I got a reply back from them as well with a whole bunch of stuff and paperwork and told me what I needed to do. But one of the stipulations was, you have to be American. <laughs> and of course, I, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> the end of the dream, I guess that dream wasn't really a, such a strong dream. It was just an idea. But then again, you know, you could always do that as an actor. <laughs> well, you know more than most people, you can be a spaceman as an actor. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to fly a spaceship. <laughs> um. <laughs> So, so, so drama school happens. Uh, I mean, if it's anything like my experience of drama school, you, you, you become incredibly close with, with the people that you're working with. It's this yeah. kind of company feel. Uh, and then you go out into the big wide world and that three years of um, collaboration sort of disappears and, and you're left on your own to kind of fend for yourself. Mm. And you've talked a little bit already about, you know, having other jobs and, and looking to uh, apply your skills in in other directions. So, what what were those early years of acting like, and and how did they lead you into the the, the kind of real world, as it were? Yeah, uh, I mean that's a great question. Uh, I I love the collaborative experience of being an actor, and if I think back about the thing that I love most about it, it was that everything was an adventure. Exactly. You know, you'd go away with a, a group of people, some of which, most of which you'd never, you know, you'd never met before, and you form these deep, intense relationships because you've got this this focal point, the play, you know, whatever it was, if it was television, to put together, and you play your part in that. And so, um, I love that. And 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 in between jobs, I I started to work in a sales company, it was something I could easily drop into and drop out of, and also something I could use my skills in because sales is, is mostly about communication and it's about understanding and, and forming sort of strong relationships. And so I found myself using those skills um, and, and working in an environment, a sales environment. And there was a lot of pressure in the sales environment in those days because it was commission only. only. So if you didn't sell, you didn't make any money. And, and that, kind of, that kind of brought people together as well because we were all young. We were all, we were all sort of finding our way in life. And... Um, and therefore, I found that quite a collaborative experience because I would leave and go and do a play, come back. And so I, always, I never felt that I was there permanently, but I, and people were transient. So every time I'd come back, there'd be different people. And so I found parallels mm. between working as an actor and, and working, basically working in a job that wasn't acting. The, the, the same things that meant you were going to be successful in the one were the same things that meant you were going to be successful in the other. And so I love the collaborative experience. And I, as I mentioned before, I had the opportunity to go to South Africa. And so I went down for three months. And my job was to observe and see what was going on because the company wasn't performing well. And South Africa is an amazing place. It's such a mix of cultures. Um, it's called the Rainbow Nation for a reason. And, and what was interesting is, is that it was, it was being mismanaged. Um, I say mismanaged. It wasn't being managed well because... The manager for the office in South Africa lived in the UK and was in the UK for four weeks and South Africa for two. And so largely people were directionless. They had no management. Mm. And, and when people are directionless, you know, they, they, didn't, they didn't really um, feel the need to perform at a high level. And therefore they didn't. And so what I, what I discovered when I was there is that people lacked any, any form of vision, any form of purpose. I mean, there was, if you ask people what they wanted, they didn't know. And this is the reason why, you know, people were not performing, why sales were really low. Um, and what I found was at the end of three months, my, the, my boss said to me, if this was your organization, what would you do? And I remember saying, uh, it sounds a bit harsh now, but I remember saying I would, I would let everybody go and start again. And, and he said, okay, well, that's what I'm offering you. He said, I'm offering you the chance to, to run it. And, and I was so excited by the prospect of doing that. I'd completely, I'd drifted out of acting. Now, three months I'd been away and, and here I was in this amazing country yeah. with this uh, great opportunity. And so I made the decision to stay and basically build a company up from the ground, which is what I did. Rehired people and 
And and the reason why I did because the reason why people were working there was was unclear before. People were sort of drifting in and drifting out. Whereas when I rehired, I was rehiring based on a vision and a purpose of what the company stood for. And the other thing that was really important is that I could, in the hiring process, I could really get to understand the individuals and and yeah. and, and link their own sort of personal dreams to the journey of working with, with that organization. And so I completely rehired a new team, built it up from scratch, and within within a few months, we'd quadrupled the turnover of the company. And it was just fascinating, though, just to see that what is it that made that happen? And, and the reason I was thinking about this before I came on this call, the parallels between everything, basically, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about acting or you're talking about a company or other aspects of your life, the same things that make things successful actually are universal. And yeah. by applying the same, those universal principles, you can get you know, better results in what you're doing. And it was... It was really that process of, uh, of um, connecting people to their sense of purpose really that made all the difference. And, and intention, what's your intention? We talk about intention a lot. And intention is everything. You know, it's why you do what you do. And if you, if you know what that is, you can find all kinds of ways and flexibility to get there. And, and so that was the journey really that I was on, just is applying principles that I'd, I'd learned elsewhere into a business environment. And when I look at companies see film sets you know in film sets you've got departments and all those departments have to work together and if you get a, a film set that's working really well it's like a well-oiled machine and you get amazing results but if you get a film set that's fractional and departments are arguing with other departments and those kinds of things you, you know you're, you're in trouble and it's exactly the same in business and so um, what I got from that experience was was create something with a common purpose and, and bringing people together who had different, different dreams and goals of their own individually, but connected to a common purpose, which was the vehicle of the company, it was the thing that made all the difference. And, um, and, I, and I find it very difficult to separate uh, one thing from another. I'm a, quite a big picture chunker. And I can, you know, for me, I can see how all it's come together universally. And so I think that's, that's the thing is understanding the things that make a difference. Sorry to interrupt, but before we continue with the episode, I've got a favour to ask. I'm on a mission to get this podcast in the hands of as many people as possible. So if you found what you've heard so far valuable, please, please, please like, comment, rate and subscribe. These things make a huge difference to our reach. And if you're open to it, if you happen to know just one person, someone who just like you would benefit from listening to these conversations, then please share the podcast with them. Let's get on with it. So, so where did this kind of curiosity for human behavior and human performance come from? You know, when when you and I first met, um, you were you were running a, a training company. I remember seeing an ad on Groupon for an NLP training course and being at a time in my life where I thought, oh, that 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 sounds interesting but I wasn't quite sure. And then I went onto the website and I saw that you'd been an actor um, and I thought, oh, he must have, we must have something in common. So I'll be in a safe pair of hands uh, or at least it will be entertaining. <laughs> so, uh, so I, so I came along, but I, th there must be a, a, a kind of journey to, you don't just go from being a, a sales leader to, to running a, a training company. So where did that curiosity come from and what led you into NLP? Uh, drama, uh, storytelling. You know, uh, the, the thing about being an actor is you, you have to step into different characters' shoes when you're an actor and you have to understand what's driving them. You know, where are they coming from? Why are they making the decisions that they make? And, and what's, what's their journey? You know, as one of the things we do as actors typically is we'll look at not only the life of the character in the play, but what's their life leading up to when that play started and, and where are they going to go you know, beyond it? And you, you have a timeline, really. So everything is a story. And, and what's fascinating is, is how, you know, on one level, we're all on a, a similar journey, but on another level, we're on a completely different journey. People have different things that they want. Um, and I think the process of being fascinated by films, by being fascinated by storytelling, 
by then being an actor and, and having to have that behavioral flexibility to, to step into one character with one set of values and dreams and behaviors and then step into another made me realize, first of all, being an actor, we can change. Because, you know, I had to sound, you know, talk in a certain way, walk in a certain way, think in a certain way with one character and then something completely different in another. And then suddenly realizing, you know, we have so much flexibility built in that we don't really use it. We get the opportunities, you know, when we're, if we're doing something like acting to do that. But people who are not actors, how do they express that? Where do they get to express that? And most people don't. And, and what can happen is people can think that they are just the way that they are. And, and it's that fascination with helping people realize that there are more options and there are more choices. And when you step into those other worlds, different doors open and different things happen. And then, you know, suddenly the story of life, your story from this point forward, becomes a blank page again, rather than you can almost see where everything is going before you get there. And it's that fascination of, of um, helping people realize that they have choice when see people don't think that they do. Um, and I think it's that. It's, it's, that's a never-ending journey because we're also on our own journeys. We don't know what's next for us or what else is possible for us. So it's, it's like stepping into this, this amazing sort of world of imagination and the link between imagination and reality, you know, because your imagination can lead into a reality, dreaming of being an actor and then become one, uh, for example. And, and it's that, really, I think it's that fascination that will always be there. There'll, there'll be people listening to uh, the podcast that are thinking, what, what is this NLP thing? Um, uh, would you mind kind of explaining a, a little bit about the the history of NLP and where it comes from. You, you, you trained with one of the founders. So talk, talk us through what the toolkit is at a big picture level. Yeah, very big picture level. I mean, NLP started in the um, early mid seventies. And if you think about, you know, the sixties the was sort of free love and that big sort of hippie movement and so on. And then you had things like the Vietnam war and um, you had uh, a whole different thing happening in the seventies. And there was this quest really to, to understand ourselves more deeply. Humanistic psychology sort of exploded at that time. And this part of the world in California, um, Santa Cruz, there were lots of things going on. Um, Timothy Galway was writing The Inner Game of Tennis, which became the first real book on coaching. Again, thinking about how we can make more of our lives and get better results. And the question, the founding question of NLP was, what is the difference that makes the difference? between people who excel in what they do and other people who are merely average in the same thing. What's the difference? And so if you look at neuro-linguistic programming, neuro is the mind and how we take information in from the world around us through our neurology. Linguistic is how we attach language to the experience that we're having. And then uh, programming is the behavior, the patterns of behavior based on the meaning we give our experience. And the idea is that we're all operating from our maps of the world. In other words, we take experience in. It's the interpretation of experience that creates our version of reality. And so therefore, our version of reality determines what we do and what we think is possible for ourselves. And so how we create the map, our own maps of reality, becomes the interesting thing. It's the filters that we use to make sense of the world, our values, our beliefs, uh, how we interpret uh, past experiences and so on. So NLP offers a, a whole range of tools to understand that process and then work with those filters, values, limiting beliefs, etc. so we can change our maps. And if we change our maps, we'll change the behavior um, as a result of that. So that's really the, the sort of big picture process of NLP. It started in the 70s and has sort of been growing ever since. Mm. I, I mean, going through my NLP training from practitioner to master practitioner to trainer um there were always lots of parallels with my time at drama school and you've you've talked to that already i think one of the key things was actually around you know physiology or, or presence or b body language and, and what a big part that that plays in uh, our mindset and then our, our results so from a from a physiological perspective, from a body perspective, if we're if we're thinking about pitching, if we're thinking about presenting or or you know leading a team and and showing them that we're a, a safe pair of hands, what role does the body 
play in that and what can listeners be doing or thinking about in order to uh, you know, find the difference that makes the difference? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, change can come from the inside out, um, but it can also come from the outside in. And so therefore, if, if you look at the work of people like Amy Cuddy, uh, in terms of the mind-body link, we, you know, we've known about the mind-body link for you know, millennia, but actually science now can start going some way to, to showing what's going on. When you change your physical uh, body shape, then there are chemical changes that go on inside the body. So if you stand in a power pose, as Amy Cuddy would say, then you'll get, you know, increase your levels yeah. of testosterone, decrease your levels of cortisol. So from a, a very, very simple point of view, if you, if you want to gain more confidence, if you want to also give the impression to others that you, you are more confident, then if you adopt a more confident looking position, body position, uh, others are going to perceive that, but you're also going to feel it yourself. And so if you want to, if you're, if you're leading by example, um, you know, by adopting a, a, a stronger body shape, by sitting up, for example, by sort of raising your head, you will begin to feel different and you will begin to perform differently too. So that's very simple. Just something really, really small can make such a big difference. And again, think about your physical presence. Think about what others are perceiving in you. I mean, if we're slouched, the energy sort of drains out of our bodies. Um, but also when others perceive us, we tend to model each other. So other people will feel that energy and, and match it unconsciously. And therefore, you know, if we want our teams to be more, um, to have more energy, to be more positive, then, you know, if we are that too, they will naturally start to model us. But also, you know, if you're teaching people techniques to be able to do this for themselves, something like changing your body position is such a simple thing to do. And yet when they connect yeah. with that, you know, they'll notice the difference. I think it's easy, interesting. You you said, you know, there are basically two ways of approaching it, so inside out or outside in. And I always kind of think about that from an acting perspective as well. It's like, okay, I can, you know, I can do all that deep work about the character and understand who, who they are and what, what they're looking to achieve and what the relationships are and that. Or I can just put on this cape and all of a sudden you know i i feel like the character um and i think in you know in in the business world we we forget that we have those options available to us i, re I remember very distinctly at the beginning of my career um working with business that i would i had a particular suit that i would wear to um to, to training sessions or to coaching sessions and it just made me feel like I was able to deliver the material in a much more powerful engaging way and and it was you know it was just a jacket that like my knowledge didn't change my experience didn't change but I, all that changed was probably the position of of my shoulders and it was probably about one and a half millimeters because of the shoulder pads you know um so I think I think that shift is so subtle but so profound, and and it's easy for us to kind of miss those sorts of things. When when you think of that kind of NLP toolkit, what are some of the what are some of the quickest wins that people can can take, and and where would you, you know, if this is spark curiosity for people, where where would you direct them to to put their attention? Um, I, I would I would say if you're looking to work with other people, for example, and, and we so often are in the business world, that the the one of the strongest ways of working with another person is to build a, a strong connection with somebody, and therefore being able to listen to other people and understand where they're coming from is such a basic, such a basic need. I remember being in when I was in South Africa, I was lucky enough to be there while Nelson Mandela was still around, and what people used to say about Mandela was that when he talked to you, you felt like you were the center of the universe. And there's some like, um, something about the gift of presence. I mean, one of the things of Virginia Satir, one of the modeling projects of NLP, Virginia Satir, uh, one, one of the things that she used to say is one of the greatest gifts that you can give another human being is the gift of your presence. You know, when you're there with them, really be there with them. Don't be thinking about your washing or thinking about what you're doing this evening. You know, be, literally be there. But also show an interest in another person. Um, and acknowledge what you've heard. If they've said something, you know, comment about it, ask a question about it. Then when you, you know, when you have a stronger relationship, when you feel that somebody actually does care about to say, 
you know, we have a couple of basic needs as human beings. One is to be listened to and, and therefore give people the space to speak. Don't interrupt, you know, listen to them. And secondly, to be understood. It's, it's not enough just to listen, but, you know, if you ever feel misunderstood, it's frustrating. And so make sure that you're understanding where other people are coming from and just taking the time to do that. And often people don't feel in a business world that they have the time to do that. But actually, what happens because of poor communication is going to cost you a lot more time than spending those extra few seconds making sure you do understand somebody. Respect where, you know, where other people come from. There's a, a presupposition in NLP, which is respect for other people's maps of the world. And it doesn't mean you have to agree with them. But respect for them means that, you know, you'll listen and you'll understand. And additionally, you know, we don't go around growing by just we already know. One of the strongest ways to grow professionally as well as personally is to understand what other people are thinking and doing, because maybe sometimes you're going to hear something that's going to be useful for you to update your own map so that you can continue growing too. So again, listen to people, um, acknowledge people, have that level of respect for people because it can only be a positive. That's a simple win. And yet that could be yeah. game changing. It's interesting, isn't it? The, 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 these things are simple in, in terms, you know, from a conceptual point of view. Yeah. But they're not so easy to play out in, in you know, the busyness of, of life. And I, I think that presence piece is just so, so powerful, whether that's in the meeting room or whether that's around the, the dining room table, especially because of the, the prevalence of, you know, devices, mobile phones, we're having virtual meetings and we're, we're kind of half listening and we're sending some emails at the same time. And the, you know, dogs and the kids are then in the background. The, the gift of your presence is, is absolutely huge. Mm -hmm. uh, you, uh, you wrote a book called my 31 practices, which is all about values. Um, and you know, you've, you've mentioned values already in, in the conversation today, what part do you think values play in our success? I think they play, play an enormous part in our success because if we understand what our values are, and our values are basically what's important to us, they're like a moral compass really for us, what's important to us. If we understand what our values are, then we can make decisions which are in alignment with those values. Um, I gave you an example earlier where a director sent me a, a line saying, if we all go around breaking contracts, where does that leave any of us? And that completely changed my behavior because processing that, that is a value. You know, that kind of integrity is a value. And therefore, it, it made it very easy for me when I understood that, for me to be able to turn down that one job and accept the other, for example, because it was in alignment with what I believed was important to me. And not enough people actually spend time really connecting with what their values are. Why it's important is that when you understand what your values are, you'll tend to make better decisions, decisions which are more in alignment with who you are from an identity level as well. And therefore, um, it's like organizations, you know, organizations are always talking about values. If an organization has a, a list of values on its wall, let's say four values, but they don't live those values, then those values become a target. People laugh at them. And yet you should be able to tell what an organization's values are and what a person's values are simply by observation. Because again, when you do something that's in alignment with your values, um, you know, it, 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 it says something about your character, characteristics. Characteristics are repeated behaviors. Um, and again, if, we're, if we are living true to our values, then not only will, be in, we, will we be in alignment with who we are, but also it will show in terms of, of everything we do. Someone will be able to understand our values by what we do. When we compromise a value, and I, you know, I'd ask this for anyone who's listening to this podcast, think about when, when you've been asked to compromise a value of yours, like, for example, that contract issue. How do you feel if you compromise a value? And generally speaking, you're going to feel out of alignment. You're going to feel conflicted as opposed to how do you feel when you do something that is important to you and it's in alignment with that, you feel good. And so values act as a big decision-making compass as well when we understand what they are. And as, as an organization, you know, an organization, if it hires people who believe what it believes, but also hires people who share the values of that organization, you're gonna have a company that 
um, is going to be filled with individuals who are working because they believe in something and a way of working um, because they believe in something which, which is what unifies them and unites them to that organization. So values are a great tool for, for example, for HR to, to be able to hire people who share the similar values to the organization. Because mm -hmm. the most difficult thing to, to work with with people is attitude. You know, you can train for skills quite easily, but actually attitude is going to be the most difficult thing to work with. And therefore, if you, can, if you know what your values are, if you know what the organization's values are, you can hire, use that as a hiring measurement or mechanism in, in the hiring process. So I think for an organization, values are essential. Uh, do, you, do you, I mean, values feel very intuitive. They've, they, they feel kind of, you know, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gut instinct. You said that you can kind of feel when you're out of alignment with your values. It's not an intellectual process yeah. necessarily. So how, but how do you go about identifying what your values are and and can you shape and and shift them or are they something that's set if you if you think back over for example your job in you know in, in your working life you think about some of the things that you have enjoyed you've you've really loved that's an indicator that there's a value being satisfied and therefore when you when you sense that you're really enjoying something ask yourself what is it that you're enjoying about that um, and that can help you then begin to identify what's the value that's driving your response to whatever that thing is. And that could be a clue then to a value. So, for example, if somebody needs help and you go over and you see that they need help and you go and offer them some help and assistance and you can see that that makes a difference, noticing then how you feel inside, feeling good for having helped somebody, it's a fair indicator that, that for example, compassion may be a value that you hold. If you walk past somebody in a tube station at the bottom of a staircase with a heavy suitcase and, and they've got a heavy suitcase and you can see they're struggling and you passed, do you get halfway up the stairs and do you find there's something in your, the pit of your stomach telling you that, mm, you know, maybe you should have helped that person? Do you then go back and do it? And then how do they feel because of that? And how do you feel? So those are indicators that when we do something, do we feel good or do we feel bad? And what's the value that that actually then points to? is a good way of understanding what some of our values are. Uh, what was the second part of your question? I... Uh, it was about whether, whether values shift. I mean, I, just mm. to kind of drill down into what you just said there, though, it, when we've run um, training programs together and we, we get people to work on uh, these, their values and, and uncovering their values, it always um, delights me but also surprises me actually how little attention we we pay to these things so once people start to get a list of 10 or 11 words on a on a page and then drill down into the the top three you can kind of see light bulbs going off for people about why that part of their job is fulfilling and maybe that part of their job isn't necessarily in alignment so i i think it's definitely worth the work um, because as you say, it does become that, that kind of compass. But the second part of the question was, can they, and do they change? So if I have a certain set of values now, are they for life or are there other opportunities? Uh, so a, the, a couple of things on that. First of all, values are context specific. So values around work may be different to your values around health and relationships, etc. Uh, you may have some values that appear everywhere. We call those our core values. Experience changes things. Um, values values operate usually, as you say, in a hierarchy. You know, we, we focus more on certain values in certain contexts. Um, for example, when you're 15 years old, you probably don't uh, have to pay mortgages and things like that. And so there, those kinds of, you know, securing things may not, be a high to you. But when you're 21, 31, 41, and you have those responsibilities, and suddenly that, they become more important. So there's value shifts in the hierarchy. And experience can also, also um, shift that. I mean, I use the example of, you know, if you imagine a Hollywood actor, a really successful Hollywood actor, who's used to, you know, earning millions per movie and living in a big mansion and people patting their heads everywhere they go on a film set and thrusting cups of coffee in their face. Um, imagine they then get uh, invited by the UN to become a, a UN ambassador, a goodwill ambassador, and they get sent to Africa to you know, Sierra Leone, and they're in a village 
decimated by Ebola and they see people who have nothing. Uh, and even the people who have nothing are still giving them things, giving them the nothing that they have. And, uh, you know, just really getting a different kind of connection to what life is about. And you spend a couple of weeks in that environment. It's very possible that you jump back on your airplane back to your mansion in Miami or Los Angeles and, and suddenly feel that there's a values sort of shift happened. Um, so values can absolutely shift um, and change mainly through context and experience or experiences that we're having. So yes, they can I want for us to reevaluate our values, our beliefs on a regular basis. Yeah, uh, that that really resonates for me because if I you know think about becoming a dad, for example, that that definitely shifts what was important to me. You know, pre pre now the idea of you know going down a white water river in a kayak was incredibly exciting, and then all of a sudden I was like, no, that's no longer in alignment with keep creating a safe environment for for my daughter and uh you know having a, a having a head <laughs> when i come back <laughs> from holiday um so yeah i, that is, I think it's it, it's a really fascinating area that that people should explore if if they want to understand you know what what the drivers are that that help them um achieve success uh, and values are i would say kind of inextricably linked to beliefs so that you know the two things cross cross over um when when we're kind of pitching so whether that's in a sales context or whether we're putting ourselves up for a, a new job or even you know just trying to make friends in a, in a new social context we often come up against those kind of limiting beliefs uh, have you got any tips about how to identify them and what to what to do to to shift them so you know it might be let's let's make it very simple in a in a social context you know my my belief might be um you know i'm a, i'm a little bit awkward uh, and and no one wants to make friends with me like how, how do i how do i change that yeah i mean it's a great question because we all carry limiting beliefs and and the great thing about beliefs by definition is they're not facts you know they are ultimately our, our best guesses in the moment about something, about ourselves, about other people, about the world in general. And I think, you know, one of, one of the simplest ways to work with beliefs is just to question the belief. You know, is that actually true? Um, and often look for a counterexample. You know, if somebody says, I never pass exams, and then you say, have you ever passed an exam? They go, well, yes. They can't hold on to, I never pass exams anymore. And so it begins to be more quantifiable. And it's easier to work with when it's more quantifiable. So you can ask questions like, how exactly is that true? You know, um, and how do, or how do you know that's true? And so, you know, one simple way is reframing something. So if somebody says um, they, they didn't call me into that meeting, so therefore they don't value my opinion, um, you can simply ask the question, okay, fair enough, but what else could that mean? And the moment somebody steps into the space of what else could that mean, they start to come up with it and that begins to loosen the belief of they don't value my opinion. And so the, there are lots of simple things because really beliefs are mind tricks that we play on ourselves. And we can equally play mind tricks that, that shift the belief to something else or to something else. And, and that's, I think, if we know that beliefs are not facts, immediately it invites us to look at different perspectives to explore that. Uh, and I think that's a, a, a thing to remind ourselves and how often do we really do that? When we carry a belief, do we actually sit and think, what if that wasn't true? How would I know that wasn't true? Or even act as if, you know, the classic act as if. So if, if, you don't, if you don't feel confident, but you act as if you're confident, then because you're acting as if you're confident, people will respond to you differently, and that can give you confidence. And so, um, you know, there are lots of things that we can do. First of all, having a mindset where we are aware that beliefs are not facts and therefore you know we we can question them that we have an active policy of let me explore these beliefs are they true let me see if i can test it here show that it's not let me find a counter example that disproves that to be true those kinds of things i think are really useful i think one of the big things that i've taken from my nlp journey is that ability to step into a, a third position so you know if, if if i'm having a conversation with steve 
the ability for me to almost step outside of myself and imagine myself as a neutral observer and and see the conversation from a different perspective and and I think one thing that I work on a lot is trying to create space to notice because it's so easy to be get to get caught up in our own beliefs and self-talk and and our own way of seeing things and if we are busy and if the pace is relentless and you know in a sales context if we're going from one deal to the next or in a leadership context if we're going from one meeting to the next creating the opportunity to pause and reflect and see the bigger picture step outside of um the the melee uh, is is really really important uh, have, have you got any tips about how to build that sort of habit because it's all very well to kind of have a coach and I'm a you know I'm a massive fan of coaching I coach I have a coach I think it's really important but we can co- we can coach ourselves so how do how do we do that effectively yeah, I mean, uh, that's a great question. And how often do we find it's easier to give advice or help other people and, and not do the same things for ourselves? Uh, yeah. yeah, first of all is the awareness of it. I think awareness is everything. Uh, John Grinder in NLP calls awareness the mother of all skill sets because you know, what I'm aware of, I can, I can either control or exercise choice over. What I'm unaware of controls me. And therefore... Um, just the awareness of knowing that, taking a breath, pausing, exactly as you say, take a breath. But also um, that, that whole thing of being able to zoom in, zoom out. It's very difficult when you're in the middle of the, the trees you know, to see the forest. But if you were to zoom out, you, know, you can see that. So this thing of, of getting perspective on any situation you find yourself in from a reflection point of view. You mentioned stepping into what NLP calls the third, into the neutral observer. There's also, of course, the second position, which is stepping into the shoes of somebody else and seeing what they see. And both of those Absolutely. things, by definition, are perspective shifts. So we see the same situation differently from a neutral observer position than from the position of maybe stepping into somebody else's shoes. And from our own perspective, every angle, if you like, every perspective reveals something different. And to truly understand something, this is one of the phrases uh, typical sort of phrases you learn at NLP, which is in order to understand any situation, you need to see it from at least three different perspectives, if not more. And mm-hmm. NLP didn't create that, it brought in from somewhere else. But again, that whole thing of perspective is so important. So taking, I think one of the things is taking the moment. In b- the busyness of business is that we often feel we don't have time. But again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the cost of doing something uh, and getting a poor result is going to cost you a lot more time fixing that than actually making sure you don't get into that situation in the first place. So the first thing is to realize that we do have a minute. We do have five minutes. You know, we can find that time. Yeah. And, and making sure that we do that. And if we feel that we're in a rush, you can sense that in your body as well. If you feel you're in a rush, just take a pause and ask yourself the consequences of, of, of getting it wrong and the benefits of getting it right. And, and just give yourself that moment. I think this is a very simple tool. You know, pause, breathe, get some perspective on where you are before you make a decision. Um, without getting too technical, you know, we have an autonomic nervous system. We have fight, flight, or freeze, which is a very common phrase that people talk about. We have rest and repose at the opposite end, and we have coherence in the middle. Fight, flight, or freeze takes away our ability to remember, you know, our memory, our long-term memory, our short-term memory, because all we need to do is fight, flight, or freeze. And it's not good to make business decisions or any real important decision from that other than fight, flight, or freeze if you're in danger. And therefore, we do have, it takes about 30 seconds to get into coherence, 30 to 45 seconds. By breathing is the fastest way to do it. Who doesn't really have that? If you're not in danger of fight, flight, or freeze, who doesn't have in a business context 45 seconds? Excuse yourself and go to the toilet. You know, yeah, um, yeah. take a glass of water. You know, something like that. Everybody will forgive us that. And yet the decision-making process could be greatly enhanced by giving yourself that that moment, that perspective. And so don't let yourself get fooled into the narrative of I don't have time to do that. That's another belief, for example. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Steve, your your passion for this is is amazing. And and I could 
talk and geek out with you uh, all day. Um, but I'm I'm going to wrap things up and and ask you uh, one final question. Um, if you could go back to uh, that that room and uh, with the young man sweating <laughs> over over the minutes of the meeting, uh, what what advice would you give uh, to, uh, to to that young man um, from all of the experience that you've had uh, since? <laughs> uh, I was going to say don't don't do something just to impress a girl, uh, but that's not my advice. <laughs> that's not my advice. Um, I. I I, th- I think breathe actually is um, is one of the strongest bits of advice I could give anybody. Um, it's, it's it's never as bad as you think it is. It's yeah, just get some perspective because what what causes all of those that, that angst and that sweat and all that stuff is the process we're running in in our minds, what we're telling ourselves, and these things aren't real. Um, it's, it's just to if. Everything is an illusion in terms of the meaning we give something, because if we give something one meaning, that's what we believe it is. We give it another meaning, we believe it's that. And therefore, I think my advice would be choose your illusions carefully or choose your illusions wisely, I think. Amazing. Steve, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Great pleasure. Thanks, Dominic. Thanks for listening to the Why Life's a Pitch podcast. If you'd like to improve the way you pitch and communicate, I'm giving away a special gift to all my listeners. We've developed the Pitching with Impact scorecard to help you benchmark your pitch performance in six key areas. It will take you less than five minutes to complete and you'll receive a detailed personalized report packed full of insights and ideas to help you improve and grow. Just head over to dominiccalento.com forward slash scorecard to get started.